Hello. This week we continue our look at the early church. Uh, our Imagination in Action series is uh, the idea is helping to spark our imagination, which helps to guide us in our actions. And so we've been looking after Easter at the early church, thinking of Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verse 42. They devoted themselves, it says in the early church, they devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Last week we talked about fellowship, the way they built in the early church that community, both internally in terms of the way they interacted with each other as the church, and also in the world through their service, their works of mercy. That this week we're going to look at the second, that next part, the breaking of the bread, which means something different than just eating, because that's really part of fellowship. That this is a specific ritual. We're calling to mind where Christ took the bread, blessed it, broke it, gave it to them. It's the Eucharist, as we call it, or the celebration of the Mass. That this is part of what they dedicated themselves to, something that's essential for us, the Eucharist. That the breaking of the bread, again, we think of the Passover meal, which is what was the Last Supper that in which Jesus took the bread, broke it, said, this is my body. And then, of course, the wine, this is my blood. The breaking of the bread and multiplication of the loaves, for example, uh, in John chapter 6. Um, and actually, in every gospel, there's the miracle of Jesus multiplying the loaves. But in John chapter 6, they ask more about it and it reveals that this is not just repeating the miracle of Moses of multiplying the manna in the desert, but this is actually something deeper. Instead of just multiplying manna in the desert, bread that he says your ancestors ate and still died, he says, the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. That he deepens this, this teaching. And then, of course, in Emmaus, uh, after on the day of the resurrection on that, we call Easter Sunday, um, he meets his disciples on the road to Emmaus. He breaks open the scripture. He breaks open the scripture so they may understand the Old Testament, what it was preparing for. They ask him to join him for dinner. He takes the bread, blesses it, breaks it, and disappears. That his physical body is no longer present. But we see this as a sign of his presence in the Eucharist. That this is one of the key ways that he fulfills his promise. I will be with you always, even until the end of the age. Being with them in the sacrament of the Eucharist. So this is something that's key. It's essential. It's something that for us is at the heart of our celebration as a church. That the Eucharist or the Mass is a key moment for us. And with everything, though, I've been kind of drawing different stories. And so there's one that I kind of came across relatively recently within the last year. Um, I read it during the, the stay-at-home time. Um, well, part of it. And it's something that to me that is kind of spoken to what it is that we do in the celebration of the Mass. It is connected, it's part of the, what's called the Stormlight Archive series by Brandon Sanderson, which is part of his larger Cosmere series. So it's kind of a grand fantasy type world. So like Lord of the Rings or Wheel of Time, um, Name of the Wind, something like that. Actually, Brandon Sanderson finished Wheel of Time when the author of that series passed away. So Brandon Sanderson kind of finished the last three books um, in collaboration with what he had written. Uh, it's a type of genre that has been a favorite of mine since I was in junior high, high school. Um, just, you know, kind of these big epic stories. Again, kind of Lord of the Rings maybe being the spark uh, for those. But the Stormlight Archive is one that's currently being, being written. And I don't want to give spoilers because if I, I highly encourage it. If you're interested in that type, it's a great series. Um, and it ha part of the fun of it is the way that there's things that are revealed, you know, things that aren't you don't realize in the beginning, and and kind of there's a lot of clever preparation and and thought in it. Um, but so I, I'll give very minimal outline to avoid spoilers. But there's a character who realizes a power that he has. That there is in this kind of world, there's three three worlds, I should say, in this universe, three levels. So it's kind of my uh, body, mind, and spirit. So you have the material world where we are, you have the mental world of thoughts and ideas, and then you have the spiritual world, especially where the, the divine power is or the, you know, that, that type of power and strength. 
and there are three different places, and they don't necessarily interact. But one character uh, develops or realizes the ability to join them all together in a what they call a perpendicularity, and or the a moment where these three worlds are brought together. That our world, that the world of ideas and the divine power of God are all made present in one moment, and it has a specific uh, impact in this world. And so why, why that struck me reading it was because there is a classic tradition of talking about the three parts of the church that are united in the Mass. So you have the church on earth, sometimes called the church militant, the part that's still in the battle of life, so to speak, um, us here. You have the church under purification, those um, who have died in, on their, we call in the state of purgatory and their preparation for heaven, their final purification of heaven. And then you have the church triumphant, those that are fully rejoicing in heaven, that these three, we believe, are united together. Likewise, another thing we talk about is, in a sense, each Mass is uniting us to key moments. So the Last Supper was on Holy Thursday, but it was uniting to Jesus' sacrifice on the cross on Friday, and also uniting to his resurrected body on Easter Sunday. We'd also say, you know, the upper room where this happened, so the upper room where they celebrated the Last Supper, the upper room where Jesus appeared to them after the resurrection, the upper room where they were, they were praying in an upper room when the Holy Spirit came on Pentecost. That what is happening in the Mass, I think the most important thing to know about it is that it is not just a memory. It's not just a human remembering of something that happened in the past. That this is how we often maybe think of it. This is what a lot of our, our rituals or different things in the world that we do are. They're a calling to mind or kind of thinking of something that is, uh, it happened in the past so that we can continue to learn from it and be inspired by it. And that's not a bad thing. But again, but Mass is something more than that even. It's making present all those things. That it's not that Jesus is dying again on the cross or something new is happening in a sense, but what happened, those kind of eternal moments, again, those, those timeless moments you know, of his offering on the cross, of his rising from the dead, of the pouring forth of the Holy Spirit. You know, it's fitting they all happen in an upper room, a similar type you know, place, that we can then realize that that's what's happening at Mass, that we're being united into Christ's prayer, that what makes the, the Mass so powerful is not us, <laughs> it, although we're called to bring our whole heart and mind, our heart, mind, soul, and strength in that prayer, but it's primarily something that Jesus is doing. The Mass has a value above any merely human prayer, that it's Christ's prayer directly. Christ prays in us in our personal prayer, but there's a dis different level when we're talking about the Eucharist. That when we're talking about true love, offering a gift to, to somebody, that it flows from what is it that that person desires and wants, not that what do we want to give. That in the Mass, we offer you know, what the Lord asks from us. You know, we can come up with great songs, we can come up with great prayers, we can come up with great devotions. Those things are great, they help us out. But those are things that we created to give to God. That Jesus at the Last Supper creates this new ritual, this new development of the old Passover meal. It says, do this in memory of me. Do this in memory of me. That it's not just, it'd be nice if you thought about this sometimes or make something similar in memory of me, but no, do this in memory of me. Or not just again, well, do this once or twice in your life. You know, do this, you know, keep. And so we, the church discerned in those, you know, pretty much right off the bat. I shouldn't say pretty much, I should say right off the bat, even in the Acts of the Apostles, you know, as they dedicate themselves to the breaking of the bread, which again, the celebration of the Eucharist, um, the celebration of the Mass. And so it's something I think that's so important for us to, to recapture. That it's a moment, again, that we unite in that prayer when we're present and more than physically, of course, our body may be in the church, but our mind may be way off somewhere else. But if we can bring our mind and our body and our attention and our focus all together in the Mass, which is hard, and it takes time, and, you know, it often might be we go back and forth as we go through, but trying to keep connected with that, you know, we connect to a power and a strength that's more than just us. Again, kind of the bringing together of the worlds. We pray for the faithful departed. You know, we offer Masses uh, for the faithful departed. We celebrate with the saints. We join in prayer with our brothers and sisters throughout the world. 
that wherever Mass is being celebrated, you know, we're connected with that. I think it's a time, you know, that there is that grace that's offered of the spiritual communion, that when there's a, a significant reason why we're not able to be together in person, so of course the pandemic, or even other times with sickness or other needs, um, there may be, again, legitimate times that we're not able to uh, be together in person. But because the Mass is something, again, that is a drawing together of worlds, we can, you know, we have that concept of the spiritual communion, that we can enter in to receive, um, open ourselves to the graces of that divine moment, uh, even if, again, we're not there, able to be there in person. That when we pray, you know, at times there is a prayer that we pray in the in the church, especially priests or religious uh, sisters or religious brothers, pray called the Liturgy of the Hours. I often think of that, you know, uniting in that time of prayer with the graces of the Masses being celebrated throughout the world. Since there's, with the time zones, there's probably a Mass going on at all times of the day, uh, somewhere in the world. So we unite to that. Because in a sense, there's only one Mass. In a sense, there's just that one eternal grace that's being celebrated in heaven. This may be my final point is, uh, I think a, the other great scriptural moment in terms of the Mass is looking in the book of Revelation. That in heaven they see the celebration of the wedding feast of the Lamb. They see the altar, they see the Lamb, they see, you know, I think uh, ultimately that it's that eternal celebration in heaven being made present on earth. The graces of that being made present. We have the opportunity to receive uh, the body and blood of Christ. That this is something that we'll talk more about Corpus Christi comes up right after the end of Easter, and then later uh, this summer we'll have the great meditation on the chapter 6 of John. So we'll be talking more about the Eucharist in terms of um, the belief and the believing of the, you're receiving the body and blood of Christ. And so whether we're able to receive that in person and, and directly in the sacrament, or whether we're in a time where we reach out for that grace in, in a spiritual way, um, the whether we're not able to make it to Mass or there is a reason why we're at Mass but we're not able to receive communion, uh, we reach out to this eternal grace. You know, that they dedicated themselves to the breaking of the bread because they wanted to unleash the power of that eternal celebration of the victory of the Lamb into their life, into their community, into their world. Um, that it's something we need to recapture, uh, something that we always need to recapture. It's something we could never take for granted, uh, but it's easy to fall into that that when we celebrate the Mass, at times there may be those human elements. Uh, we may be tired, we may be stressed or distracted. Uh, maybe something doesn't go right, you know, maybe the priest doesn't have the best homily that day, or something happens with the music, or who knows what happens, you know, wherever we may be. Something, uh, there can be things that draw us away from what's going on under the, under the surface. But it's important to remember, again, what it is. This is something they dedicated themselves to. This is something that's at the foundation of the life of, of the church. This is what Christ gave at his last supper before his death. It's what he celebrated at his first supper after the resurrection in Emmaus. Um, do this in memory of me. Continue to make this grace present. I will be with you always to the end of the ages. And you'll hear he desires us to encounter him. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord, renew, us with, renew within us that strength to dedicate ourselves to the celebration of the breaking of the bread, of the Eucharist, of the Mass, the grace of the sacrament. Dedicate it to the grace you desire to give us through the sacrament, the way that we unite our love with yours in praise of God, you know, in petition for our brothers and sisters, those who have died and those uh, still in need of grace on this earth. We ask that we may be renewed, especially as we come through this time of pandemic, as we have had to adapt in different ways and sought to find what we could do to best realize this, uh, the opportunities of the moment, may continue to guide and inspire us going forward on, on how best to, to preserve this, this gift that you give us. We ask this in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.